A very good morning to everyone. I'm Tech Ten with the Investment Innovation Institute I3, and welcome to this webinar co-hosted with Aviva Investors on the topic, Climate Transition Beyond Low Carbon Investing. Now, our starting point here relates to the urgency and the scale of transformation required to align with the 1.5 degree warming objective. Now, low carbon investing is important. It's good. It's probably a given, but, but the question here is, is that sufficient? And how can investors deliver long-term capital growth for a climate conscious and sustainable future? So, so this is an investment question with serious environmental implications. And to address that, I'm pleased to welcome, uh, in fact, a, a tech team of uh, two senior executives from Aviva Investors with me uh, today. Uh, we've got Rick Status, who is the Senior Global Responsible Investment Analyst and the Climate Specialist. Uh, Rick has a primary focus on climate change and responsibility for ESG coverage of the industrial sector. He has almost 20 years experience in this area where he was formerly head of uh, responsible investment at Schroders for 16 years and a global director of the CDP, or formerly known as Carbon Disclosure Project, for two years. Uh, he has a degree in agriculture and food science and a master's in environmental technology. Uh, Rick also has a particular interest in uh, syntropic agriculture and the dual role of forests in building resilience in the food system and combating climate change. So, so certainly really interesting that we can draw up later. And, and next we've got Jaime Ramos uh, Martin, portfolio manager uh, in the global equities team. Prior to joining Aviva, uh, Jaime was at Standard Life for some 12 years covering both US and European equities. He's also been a consultant with Mercer after beginning his career as a central banker at the Central Bank of uh, Spain. Uh, Honey holds a Master's of Science in Finance from the London Business School and is a CFA charter holder. And, and Honey tells me that he also has uh, at least some connection with uh, the Australians here, where he spent uh, one term uh, his summer or winter in Adelaide High School when he was 15 years old. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this has given him a lasting impact uh, to what he is uh, today. So here we have Rick, uh, who is an environmental scientist and an investor and Jaime, who is a portfolio manager, so trying to tackle the science and investment aspects of, of this topic. So, so given the background I mentioned, in the next 40 minutes, uh, this is what we'll cover. Uh, beyond exclusion, uh, firstly. Secondly, how we can understand and quantify climate transition risk across the, the corporate value chains. Uh, thirdly, opportunities for alpha, and certainly, last but not least, engagement. So how can we actively engage with companies to ensure that they're committed to, again, the 1.5 degree warming pathway through the adoption of science-based targets? So format-wise, this will be a presentation for roughly 15 to 20 minutes. Then we'll go into Q&A with both Jaime and Rick. So again, for the audience, please feel free to submit your questions. There's a question box in the app, depending on the device, either the top or the right-hand side, and we'll endeavor to answer them uh, later on in the discussions. So please note that this webinar is for educational purposes only, not for financial advice. And this is meant for professional advice, uh, professional investors only. So over to you guys, um, Rick, for the presentation. Great, and um, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, including the personal bits. Um, so today our presentation that uh, we're very pleased to be giving to you is about how we have a strategy that is beyond just uh, a low carbon strategy and really looks at what we need to do to invest in the transition towards a warmer low carbon world. And so my, my part of the presentation is more the background uh, uh, scene setting uh, and then my colleague Jaime will go through the strategy itself. Um, so on our first slide, um, we have the chart, which I'm sure most of you will all be familiar with, where, uh, slide before that, please, um, which is uh, we're at one degrees uh, already today um, on our current commitments. We are heading towards a world of three degrees warming by the end of this century. Um, and we know that uh, thanks to the IPCC's uh, special report on 1.5 degrees that you know, every degree of warming matters. Um, so you know, the difference between a one, one and a half degree warmer world and a three degree warmer world is the difference between only 6% of, uh, of maize yield being impacted by um, the heat or 
you know, a complete disruption to the food system. Um, and, you know, that also from an Australian perspective, that as we seen from Deloitte's uh, recent research that at uh, two degrees of warming by 2050, they would expect that 6% uh, of GDP would be permanently uh, lost uh, from the Australian economy. Um, and we see similar reports coming out from McKinsey for the APAC region, where um, at, again, two degrees of warming by 2050 could lead from anything between three to 17%, um, uh, sorry, five to 13% of GDP lost in that region due to the impacts of extreme heat on productivity, namely the ability of uh, humans to uh, lose their heat is, uh, is, is hindered as, as the temperature increases. Um, so what do we need to do to avert this situation? Our next chart uh, on the next slide still shows the scale of the challenge that is ahead of us. Um, what you see on the chart on the left is the emissions trajectory to get to um, net zero by sometime around 2050, which is uh, in line with keeping temperatures to within one and a half degrees uh, scenario, or well, 66% chance of keeping uh, the temperature within one and a half degrees. Essentially, what that means is that this year emissions have to peak, and COVID has had a good, uh, well, one, one outcome of COVID has been that emissions have. Uh, decreased as a result um, and so we ha yeah, have a bit of a plateau from last year but it had to peak this year and then decline by seven and a half percent a year or 50 percent a decade out to this net zero target by 2050. Um, the area under underneath the chart there um, is uh, represents a carbon budget for one and a half degree uh, outcome and so basically what we're on our sort of current emissions trajectory of around 42 gigatons a year we would use up the carbon budget for one and a half degrees within seven and a half or eight years. So uh, time is short to keep us within this um, degree of heating by the end of the century. And what that means is that, uh, as you can see from the chart on the right, this is for a two degree outcome and taken from carbon track is excellent work. But basically, if you think about all the carbon that's embedded in the fossil fuel reserves around the world, um, we can only actually emit uh, Twenty percent of that. So the rest of this carbon is um, has, has to stay underground in in the fossil fuels, and has given rise to the concept of stranded assets, which you know means that essentially a lot of the companies on on the markets are overvalued, and we um, recognise this as the market inefficiency. Um, so that's so as we transition towards this low carbon world, we're going to transition away from the use of fossil fuels in in that and. Um, and, and as such, you'll see that as an exclusion approach. But as we see in our next uh, slide, you know, it's not just about not investing in, in certain areas. It's also about what we need to invest in to deliver on a one and a half degree world. So currently this looks at our energy system and this is taken from IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Association's remap scenario, which is their scenario that gets us to, to one and a half degrees. Um, and what you can see here is that there's currently around 95 trillion is committed to the energy investment in the energy system. As we go towards a one and a half degree scenario, we're going to have to significantly increase the investment within that. And that's because we're going to see uh, the replacement of a lot of the fossil fuel turbines, um, you know, the, the boilers, etc., with electric engines. Um, so you're going to see increased electrification of our energy system, hence uh, the increase in the overall pot. And what this charts also show is that you're gonna see a, a, a shift in the distribution or allocation of capital towards those areas that will help to mitigate emissions um, and, and deliver this more electrified world. And, and as you can clearly see there, there's a massive uh, decrease in investment within the um, fossil fuel space. And it's not just, you know, this sort of thing is going to happen because we need it to happen to deliver a one and a half degree slide uh, world. Our next slide also shows the impacts um, or shows that a lot of the arguments um, for investing in low carbon solutions are there from an economic perspective already. So here you can see um, that around the world onshore wind and utility scale solar is now the cheapest form of new bulk electricity generation uh, 
uh, for around two thirds of the world's population. And we can see similar arguments starting to take shape you know, with uh, electric vehicles versus internal combustion engines, where the lifetime or life cycle ownership costs of an electric vehicle over, say, a five year period is cheaper than owning um, uh, internal combustion engine. And indeed, as energy storage prices drop as well, we're going to see this shift towards these low carbon technologies make sense, uh, not just to deliver the one and a half degrees outcome, but from an economic perspective. Um, and so that's that's why there's a driver to to invest in these areas. But you know, the transition to a warmer, low carbon world is not just about investing in green technologies. The transition is going to impact every company, every sector of the economy and through their value chains. And slide six, um, sorry, slide seven, uh, will you know, sort of starts to demonstrate how we believe that this is going to, going to be impacting. So here you can see uh, the current state of carbon pricing around the world. Um, so about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions are covered by some form of carbon pricing scheme. Um, you know, the prices range from $1 to $127 per tonne. CO2, but on average they're about $2. Um, now the IMF in their, uh, fork, in their Davos report last year said that to hit uh, one and a half, we need probably a $70 price, price target for carbon. So not only have, are we expecting that as more governments commit to net zero and start to implement policy programs to achieve their net zero ambitions, um, you know, then we would expect to see carbon pricing schemes to increase from the current 20% coverage to, to, you know, ideally 100% coverage and the price of carbon to increase to enable that shift towards a low carbon future. And so this will impact uh, all companies through, through their value chains as, you know, as the price of carbon starts to get integrated into the cost of goods sold, companies operating costs and, in, and indeed demand for their products. Um, and we also can expect to see that from the physical side of things as well. You know, at the moment, um, you know, we can see, you know, there's increase in the amount of extreme weather as well as the chronic weather. Um, and we've seen examples of this in, in Europe for the last three years where the heat wave has caused, or the summer heat has caused the river temperatures to rise to levels that nuclear power stations in France can't use the water for cooling purposes and so have to curtail the, the output from, from nuclear generators, which is you know, an example of a chronic impact of climate change starting to impact through the value chain. And, and then from an Australian example, in 2019, Incitec Pivot reported a, um, I think it's 56% decrease in profits. Um, and this was driven by two factors. There's flooding in Queensland, um, which caused a, a three months closure to one of its plants, but also um, the drought on the East Coast caused uh, sales to decline by 34 million. Now, you know, Instep Pivot in their sustainability report cited that you know, hurricanes and tornadoes would be impacting on their operations. They didn't take into account the chronic impacts of climate change, which we're starting to see, and which my colleague Jaime will now explain how we built our, our model to integrate. Thank you, Rick. And as, as my colleague has explained, beyond focusing on companies that enable the decarbonization of the economy, <clears throat> climate change affects all sectors. Therefore, it is crucial to assess transition risk and opportunities across the market. So <clears throat> how do we do that? We need a framework. After looking at different options, we, we were not satisfied with third party transition models as they usually focus on decarbonization risk without incorporating physical impact. Also, we found that most models are not granular enough on a sector level. So we decided to develop our own framework. As you can see in the slide, it consists of two building blocks. The first on the left side of the slide is a proprietary top-down sector analysis, incorporating both decarbonization and physical impact risk. Using multiple research sources and the knowledge and experience of our climate specialists, we have scored all 159 sub-industries in a scale of high, medium and low risk. The second block on the right-hand side, it is an assessment of how each company is managing their transition risk. 
For that, we use a company's CDP scores as a, as a proxy, CDP, uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project. So we have these two blocks. So how does the model work? For, for a company to be considered as a potential climate transition opportunity, it must, it must have a minimum CDP score, which is in part determined by the risk score of the industry. For example, a company in a high risk industry like chemicals would require at least a B score by CDP to be considered. We believe this framework addresses many of the shortcomings that I mentioned before and can be applied to other asset classes, not only equities. Now, Dealing with climate transition risk, it is not only about risk models, but also about active engagement. Please, next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. It is fundamental to engage with companies so they fully incorporate climate change into their business model and decision making. We believe that the best way for companies to do that is to align themselves with the Paris Agreement. Now, how can they do that? In our view, the best way is by adopting science-based targets. These are climate goals in accordance with the latest climate science and verified by a third party. Crucially, given the lack of data, it pushes companies to improve disclosure. We believe all companies should report using the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures Framework, also known as TCFD. This is not only our opinion, but many financial regulators are looking to make mandatory, and the UK government, by the way, just announced, just announced this recently. So we think that better, companies are better to get ahead of this requirement. Now, what does engagement mean in practice? Uh, please, uh, next slide. In, in the next slide, you have two case studies of companies that we hold in our climate transition strategy. First, Volkswagen. While acknowledging there are governance issues that need to be addressed, we believe that partly driven by the traumatic experience of Dieselgate, VW has become the best auto manufacturer to transition to electric vehicles. As part of the engagement process, we did recommend the company to adopt science-based targets, which they have done. The second example, a bit different, is Mars and McLemon. We believe insurance brokers are key to help companies to incorporate climate change to their risk management. And while their consultancy businesses are a leading voice on climate action, we believe the firm itself has more to do. And to that effect, we have had in-depth meetings with management and outlined a series of specific recommendations around climate strategy, disclosures, and importantly, to incorporate restrictions to controversial sectors like coal. Engagement is in an early stage, but we are hopeful that they will adopt some of our recommendations in the not too distant future. Next, I would like to go through an example to illustrate some of the issues discussed on climate transition risk and opportunities. Unilever is a good example of a company that it does neither offer a solution to climate change, nor it is usually a holding of climate investment strategies. Also, as many companies, their lion's share of their carbon footprint is both with their supply chain and their clients, what is usually referred as scope three emissions. This is described at the bottom right of, of the slide. We believe Unilever is better prepared for climate change transition. Apart from meeting the threshold of our transition risk model, they have adopted science-based targets, successfully embedding climate in their business strategy. You can see in the slide the different milestones for the supply chain and products. In our view, Unilever's climate change readiness will result in our performance. Not only they are better prepared to meet future climate transition risk, like a stricter regulation affected the supply chain of products, but also their consumer brands will be stronger. Well, I hope these presentations have been able to show how focusing only on low carbon 
is not the full picture and that incorporating a climate change transition framework provides a more holistic view of the risk and opportunities that financial markets are not pricing in. Last but not least, any climate transition strategy should incorporate active engagement as a key tool. Thank you very much for your time. And we're now happy to take questions. Thank you, Rick and, and Jaime. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, and uh, just on that note, I'd like to encourage uh, our audience to submit questions. Um, in fact, we've got one now in there. So I, I might address that first before the ones that I have. Um, so the question is, do you think that uh, enough company that if, sorry, do you think that if enough companies adopt SBT, so science-based targets, that the government will have no choice but to follow suit? I guess uh, we're alluding to the fact that, you know, corporates in Australia are fairly active and progressive. Um, governments could be stalling on that. So uh, views from Rick or, or Jaime? I can maybe go, go for, I, I think, personally, uh, I think companies are key to drive the change. Governments too, but as as the uh, you know as the audience was, was asking i think that uh, if all the companies in the world adopt science-based targets i think we will be very well ahead in terms of dealing with climate change so it's obviously it's very good that companies help with policy and so on but i think if we the companies have a chance to 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 if you want fix these market failures by by using practices and incorporating internalizing some of the companies what they do is they internalize a carbon price much higher than the carbon prices that that uh, rick rick was saying so rick i don't know whether you want to add anything to this uh... yeah i mean the only thing i would add is i think actually the trading partners are more likely to cause uh the australian government to change its attitude i think you know you can see that china japan south korea have all adopted net zero targets uh by 2050 2060 so this will put pressure on uh the australian government and it's uh, you know who it does trade with but as well as biden coming in and you know he's already signified his intention to be taking net zero target as well and if i'm not mistaken i think every state in australia also has a net zero target um so there's a lot of pressure uh on that government level thank you guys no i have another question on unilever but maybe just to to preface that um i wanted to sort of go back to the case study that that Jaime mentioned about unilever and the application of scope one two and three um, into your framework, your, your transition risk model. And I, I think again, for the benefit of those who are listening, um, in layman's terms, so scope one is literally your own emissions. emissions. Scope two is, uh, you know, for example, the electricity that you purchase. And, and these two are fairly clear and easy to quantify. The challenge is in scope three, where it relates to the value chain, the supply chain, the use of your end products, consumers, and, and the like. Um, so, so perhaps, Either Jaime or Rick will clarify. So, how do you quantify you know, emissions that are, in a sense, not of your own doing? It could be a bit vague, in a sense. Um, is this a work in progress? How do you bring that into your transition model? Um, if I'll take it, I mean, the, the two years model that Jaime presented, um, if you remember the, the bar charts, you know, the, the, the top down sector or sub industry approach that we've developed looks through the value chain and assesses you know, where, the, where the risks will uh, arise through a value chain. So the scope three emissions are obviously you know, refer to the upstream downstream emissions. Um, and so that high, medium, low approach will, um, will reflect the, the, where they arise. Um, we also undertake a deep dive of, of any stock that we're particularly interested in to, to have a, a, a greater sort of focus on, on what it's doing to manage uh, the value chain risk um, that it has. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, if, if I could add, I think scope three is, is it could be this conundrum at the difficulty to, 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 to measure it or assess it. I think it could be also sometimes misleading. So some companies, and in particular, I think banks that, you know, that we haven't, I mean, we try and, I mean, the science-based targets organization will, will finally come up with the recommendations for the financial sector, but it's a very difficult area to to assess the scope three. And 
Um, and sometimes they appear in many models to be very low carbon intensive, uh, which, you know, Rick and I kind of totally disagree with that, no, because banks are, at the end of the day, a reflection of the economy, and the economy is working on a, you know, very high carbon intensity in many, in many ways. So, so I think, I think, take your question is really good, and that's the question we, we is, you know, and, and there's a lot of qualitative assessment that needs to be done here, because the, there's a lot of things that we don't know, but we, we know the direction and we, uh, if you understand the business and, this, mm -hmm. and, and what is the ultimate exposure, then you can make judgment uh, on, on, this, on this topic. Sure. And, and there's a follow up question, as I said, in, in the audience. And this regards, this is regards to pricing in that, that risk. So using, say, Unilever as the example, now if you say that the market has not priced in positive T risk, how do you factor that, that in? <laughs> Uh, yeah, how do you put so, the stock valuation on T risk to claim that the market does not price it properly? Yeah, so so I think that's a great a great question. So so the, you, you, it's not going to be to the decimal point, but but I I, I guess mm. there are there are ways to you know if if you you know for example on the on the raw materials on the supply chain you know when you you mentioned in the slide we we show that they try you know they're targeting to have a deforestation free uh, supply chain. As, as basically the, the efforts on, on carbon and policy risk, you know, if, if your supply chain is, you know, it's basically relying on agriculture that, that destroys, you know, a, a forest, you, you're going to have supply chain problems. So it, sometimes it's not a question of putting a number, but it's the disruption on the supply chain that have several, you know, serious consequences. And I think, um, uh, uh, you know, you you had the sample some years ago on the Thai flats. You know that suddenly people didn't know that a lot of the semiconductor industry was depending on 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 Thailand, and then there was substantial disruption to that supply chain. So, so the, the difficulty of some of these risks is that they are one-time big exposure. Um, other times, you can just embed um, some price in carbon price that you think is the fair one, but. But to me, it's it's more important the direction, and because the the quantum of the risk can be substantial, it's a question of avoiding. So this remember, you we are in a market that, that it's a question of picking the winners. Unilever will suffer too. The, the, what we are trying to get to is they're gonna suffer much less because they'll be much better prepared. And sometimes they'll be winners. And I think in the consumer side, and, and we'll see that. I mean, I think that brands that uh, take care of sustainability and they they really you know, are truly sustainable, they're going to have much more acceptance with consumers. And particularly, in, you know, we've seen that in millennials, but I expect that to be across across the spectrum. Um, Thank you. Um, moving on, um, the, the couple of case studies you cited are very interesting. So a bit of a deeper dive. Um, the case study on Volkswagen. Now, um, you cited that there are a good case, you know, you've rated them well according to your model. But I guess most of us will be familiar with uh, diesel gates. Uh, the issues there. And and I think if you look at it, um, Volkswagen rates well on the E spectrum, your environmental, as you've put it, but on the G and the governance, not so good. Um, I, I'm just curious, I mean, yes, you're rating Volkswagen great, but are we forgetting that ESG should be seen in, in totality and not, you know, just E? Your views? Yeah. Yeah, no, so no, we're not forgetting. We, we're very conscious that governance is, is an issue. I mean, we, we have continuous engagement with Volkswagen and and funny enough, in a way, because the dieselgate was such a scandal and traumatic experience, as I was saying, apart from basically pushing them to adopt and to invest much faster on, on, on the electric vehicles. Also, they, there's been a lot of cultural changes in Volkswagen. And you know, in the last in the last meeting we, we had with them, you know, they explained to us how one of the issues with Dieselgate was that there was a culture of, you know, the the head of the team basically took the decisions and nobody said anything. You know, there was no open dialogue, you know, with, with you know, the talented employees and, and so on. So they changed totally the incentives and the way um, uh, the decisions are made. So now they need to make decisions on a, on a consensual basis in, in many of the engineering teams and, and across the company. So these are, these are the things that for us, the, the question is, is Dieselgate going to likely to repeat in Volkswagen? Mm -hmm. And we think we we are comfortable that it's, more, it's not that likely, okay? And we, we can never say never, but but there are steps. 
in terms of governance, I mean, we need to understand there is a dialogue, but, but it's, it's a difficult dialogue. I mean, it's, it's a company that is majority controlled by three shareholders. Yeah. And so, so bringing independence to that board is going to be, it's going to be a journey. And, and this is important because in engagement, you cannot get everything the first time, you know, that yes, you need to be credible and there has to be escalation. So if, if, if there is no po progress at all, we will take more drastic measures, but progress is not one to, you know, zero to a hundred. So it's, it's, it's building that relationship and continue to engage and, and obviously having clear uh, milestones for that progress. You know? So, so, so far we are conscious, mm -hmm. we also worry, but, but at the same time, we think there are, there are a lot of changes going on in, in Volkswagen culture uh, that, you know, makes that comfortable at, at this moment. Right, right. And Rick, anything to add on the engagement front? Um, um, I, I guess, again, I mean, just, just staying on, on engagement and, and it, look, this whole spectrum of things to be done, whether as you've done, you know, behind the scenes, talking to management, uh, to the other extreme where it's a bit more activist, uh, you know, public uh, a sponsorship in resolutions and AGM and so on. Um, so what you're saying is that engagement works or it, it's a process, but it works. In, in your experience, has there been instances where you struggle? I, I know there's a certain amount of subjectivity there, but you struggle and where, to the point where you might consider divesting. Are there instances in, in your experience? Yes, of course. And, and you know, I mean, for example, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to share, I mean, the, in the Marsa McLemon example, we, we think, I mean, this industry insurance broker, and particularly Marsa McLemon as the leader, I think, it, it, I mean, they can play an amazing role in, because that's the role of an insurance broker, is to go to a company and, and basically advise them of how to take care of the risk, you know, and, and, and to us. So, so it's an important holding, but obviously, they 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 needs to be some progress and 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 i think we are prepared to to you know if that progress doesn't happen we you know we we go first to basically uh, the portfolio not 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 being able to increase position and ultimately we just divest mm -hmm. in the past we have some instances in the us uh, that we we basically we are not able to get that dialogue and and you know we try we try and you know, obviously, climate, the climate strategy has not been for long, but the other strategy that, that I run that is more general stewardship, we have divested of U.S. companies when basically we have no progress, particularly related to some chemicals that, you know, we think shouldn't be used and, and things like that. You know, if, if we don't get it, we, we are not, you know, we were not gonna, we're not going to send a letter to the New York Times. We just divest, you know, but we but, I, we, but even we, after divesting, we keep trying to get the companies to 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 do the right thing uh, right um uh, it's interesting you, you mentioned marsh and mclennan because I, I know we've got friends in the audience uh, from uh, mercer and and if i may put it i, I think uh, mercer is one of the best in the business in in providing advice to you know institutional investors globally so i guess you have this group of company where you mentioned you know the insurance broking side isn't doing so well you know insuring coal plants but you have professional services doing all the right things and so on. So I guess from a portfolio manager's perspective, when you look at companies, whether Marshall McLennan or other companies, where it's a group of businesses, some doing well, according to your metrics, some not so, how do you then analyze them according to your, your model? Yeah, so so first on the model, um, Marshall McLennan, you know, it, 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 it basically fits, fits the criteria, the transition risk model. I think, um, where where we where we see there is is the, the the business has some room to improvement and and for us it's important as i was saying before because we believe that if Marsha mclemon can be a huge example and can enable big change in a lot of industries that's why we we place a lot of importance on on engagement uh, so it's a bit a special case because we we think in a way it is it, nothing negative on the contrary i think that uh, we believe they can be, as I said, an enabler. And and if they, you know, and and you know, there's elements. If they, as as a group, you know, engage and you know, and, and start to to be a leader on, on climate in in all ways, I think I think that has could have a lot of repercussions. I think I think the coal thing is is obviously as we we haven't discussed in detail, but you know, the, the carbon the the carbon intensity of coal is the highest of all fossil fuels. 
So, so I think um, there needs to be an acknowledgement of, of that. And, and many companies, uh, have, I think we just, we just ask in the first step, which is basically no new code, no, which is, is a, you know, and, and, and I think that those steps are, are necessary, but at least to, to, to limit the, the new capacity or the new, then obviously further steps, other, other companies are more ahead that basically are putting dates to no call. And as I said, this, this is a journey. And, and in terms of the general question in, in companies, uh, it, it depends on, on how, what is the, the price of that engagement? It's, we think the price of the engagement with Mars Lehman is huge, not, not because of Mars Lehman itself, but because the repercussions that we have. In other, in other instances, you know, if a company is not listening and, and, and is not going to be changing, we, we, we might not even consider for investment because they might not have the repercussion in terms of, of the impact of climate change. I mean, we, we have no time. We, we need to focus on high price targets and, and that, that maybe it's informing our, the way of how we focus on, on this on this strategy on, on engagement sure. yeah sure and maybe from a call i'll move on to there's a question in the audience on guests so how does guests feature in you know in terms of transition risk um is rick one of the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> let me have a glass of water you're, um, you're the expert <laughs> I mean, obviously, gas is a, a, a lot, a lot more, um, or a lot less carbon intense than oil or coal. Um, so, for some, you know, it, it has been regarded as a stepping stone for the low carbon transition. I think, you know, as we're getting closer to this net zero fo focus, and the ambition is uh, ratcheting up about how do we get to one and a half degree future, and as we're seeing the sort of um, you know, the com competition coming from renewables and energy storage, for example, the role of gas in that transition is probably more, you know, more under question because ultimately, you know, gas, when you combust it, it still will release greenhouse gases. Um, you know, we have to, you know, get to net zero. So that would entail that all gas, you know, that we're building, any new gas would need to have the CCS compliant and ready right now, so carbon capture and sequestration, which would add to the cost of, of, uh, of the fuel. Um, and so, you know, that again, favors renewables uh, with smart grids and, and energy storage. So I think it's a tricky one. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, it definitely has a, a short term role, um, but I think you know, five years ago, where the arguments were much more in favour of gas, I think we've seen the, the price, the techno technological costs come down for um, renewables and for energy storage, which have changed the arguments quite a lot. I mean, obviously now there's a lot more talk about hydrogen um, yep. and the hydrogen economy. Um, you know, we had had a strong look at that. I think you know. It's quite an inflated topic at the moment. Um, there's a lot that needs to happen to make it economically viable. There's a lot of challenges ahead in actually you know, creating a hydrogen infrastructure network. We still have, um, in many cases, you know, the, the issue of carbon capture and sequestration to create blue hydrogen. Um, so, so yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I sort of bit agnostic on gas these days you know if you caught me five years ago I'd have been much more oh yeah yeah it's it's that stepping stone but you know, we, we're in an emergency um, you know we have to tackle this issue if you're investing uh, new capital into the, into gas you know th this infrastructure is going to last for 40 years in 40 years time we need to be uh, at net zero so so should you be allocating capital to those technologies or to or to yeah, you know, low carbon or zero carbon technologies that are available today. Thank you. We've got the last couple of minutes. Um, again, questions back to the model uh, and in regards to the company forecasts and uh, the the input. So um, how good are you know these company forecasts uh, that, that you guys use uh, in missions? And then what happens next? Do we actually achieve uh, you know, something from these inputs? Uh, obviously, the, the, the byline is talk is cheap, but you know, are, are these uh, something being done? Is there the momentum there to use your framework uh, across the buffer investments? Um, Jaime? 
Yeah, so, so I mean, just to clarify that this is a framework to, uh, we obviously, uh, each investor is different. We, we have basically an equity research uh, function and, and, and basically the, this framework what informs um, our idea generation and, and basically our selection of, of a stock. So, so, so in a way, this is the, not the only parameter if, if, if you want. So sure. by using this framework and, and we, what we done, what we did uh, 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 more than a year ago, it's in each of the sectors, we, uh, we, 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 we brought this climate specialist and we had in-depth training to the equity research uh, function. So they understood the climate challenges of each single sector, which obviously inform our, our, our transition risk model. So I, I, I think, as I said, I, I'm trying to, to explain, you know, in many ways, this is, this is a mosaic theory. This is not like one number that I can put in the, sure. in the store recommendation and that tells me, oh, that's a buy or it's a sell. It's basically sure. a part of how we basically make the decision of whether a stock is a buy or not. And, and, and I think um, there, are, there, there are areas that, you know, in terms of um, understanding the risk, and, and particularly because the utility uh, sector analysts or the oil and gas analysts are very aware of the chemicals, you know, are very aware of this. But, you know, the Unilever analysts, uh, you know, maybe two years ago wasn't even thinking about this, you know, and, and you know, with plastics and climate and so on, this is just the, the, the incorporation of those factors into the investment recommendations and how, you know, the growth forecast for consumer, you know, consumer products. Uh, that so there is you know the, I don't have a single number or a single way to to it's it's, it's much more complicated but in a way it's much more enriching to the to the research process yeah sure I, I think there's a follow-up question and you might answer it to tell me if you've done it says your climate risk framework integrates top down you know from a sector and industry perspective so do you also formally integrate relative transition risk from a region uh, regional perspective. So they are a result of it. So, so obviously, uh, depending on the on the industries and 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 the the way the the because we do the company assessment, too, so you can build, you know, if you want to have a regional. Uh, we also do relative in 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 for for others. As, as I said, we apply this not only to equities. So we have a credit a, a apply to credit and in credit, for example, we do because it's much easier. We do do relative. So we do long short with CDSs. In terms of the winners and losers, and, and that's you, we we are a bottom up, so we, we focus on the names, but you could build up a region's differentials if, if you wanted to. Thank you, and certainly, the, in fact, that there's no shortage of questions, uh, lots on the transition model and trying to quantify the risk. Certainly, this is a topic of, of, of interest, and we'll provide a bit more information after the webinar. We've sort of run out of time, but maybe a, a final question to each of you, a, a, a more general one: um, How confident? Are, are you guys, you know, given the momentum we have, um, that we will achieve this, uh, whether it's 1.5, hopefully, or two degree uh, uh, pathway? How confident are you guys uh, at, at the way we're going? <laughs> Rick, do you want to go first? <laughs> the, the IPC uh, criteria, likely, highly likely, very likely. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think. You know, it's close, it's tight. We don't fully understand the natural climate system. A lot of the observational changes to the climate are tracking the worst case scenarios. Um, we're seeing feedback loops happening. So, um, so yeah, I mean, but you, yeah, I've got a young daughter, Jaime's got a young, young family as well. You, know, you have to be confident, you have to live with hope and you have to believe that we can do it because the alternative is not really worth thinking about. Yeah, the, I found my purpose in fund management after <laughs> after almost 20 years in investments. I, I, I think the, the industry has a huge role to play. And to be honest, right this point is a lot of education. And so today, for example, uh, Richard Butters, who is the ESG, uh, ESG research analyst and financials, and I spent one hour and a half with a US bank explaining them everything, CDP, science-based targets, how to you know, kind of helping them to think how they can in include this in the workflow. I'm happy to do that 24 hours a day. I mean, we, we need to, and so as 
I know we get there. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm gonna try my hardest. If the little thing, and I think that's the my takeaway is each of us, we need to try how to think how we can contribute to this. And I think education and you know training is is a must, so people understand how urgent this is. Thank you, and on a very passionate comment, uh, I'd like to thank Jaime and Enrique. Uh, we'll be doing a bit more on, on issues around ESG and transition risk and to our audience. I hope this has been meaningful. We'll be putting a bit more notes after this. Uh, so thank you for listening. Hope this has been meaningful. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much.